uh, one minute past 1 p.m. here in Sydney. So I will just uh, kick off our first uh, webinar of Center for Environmental Law, Macquarie University's uh, Law and Nature Dialogue webinar series in 2022. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the, of the Macquarie University land where I, uh, I, my office and myself situate uh, the, the Watamadagan clan of the Daru Nation, uh, whose custom and, and culture keeps nurturing this land. And I sincerely pay my respect to uh, the elders past, present, and future. So it is my great honor today to uh, introduce to you our first distinguished speaker of the year, uh, Professor Zhao Yun from uh, Faculty of Law, Hong Kong University. So Professor Zhao uh, needs no introduction to uh, international lawyers, I, I believe, but I just will give a very brief one. Uh, so Professor Zhao is currently the Henry Chen Professor of International Law and Head of the Depart Department of Law at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he has obtained a, a PhD from uh, Erasmus University of Rotterdam in the Netherlands and also the famous Leiden University with an LLM. Um, he's also a representative of the Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific of the Hague, the Hague Conference on Private International Law. Uh, also, he uh, holds a number of uh, also, uh, a number of important roles in the Chinese Society of International Law and the Chinese Law Society. So, uh, Professor Zhao uh, uh, is specialized, uh, especially in the field of the space law. So, I mean, it is our great pleasure today to have Professor Zhao to uh, talk to us about the space law because you know. Uh, for us here at the Center uh, for Environmental Law, Macquarie University, our vision is to uh, is to develop a future-proofing environmental law that can really re based on a reimagination of of the relationship between uh, human and nature. And I think the outer space, which is which is kind of a, like a frontiers for the human exploration and exploitation, uh, could potentially be a very interesting. A frontier also for us to reimagine the relationship between uh, human and nature and also through a reimagination of law and nature. So without further delay, uh, Professor Zhao, uh, the floor is yours and the presentation uh, uh, will last for uh, 30 to 40 minutes and then we will follow up with a, a Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask uh, at the stage. Okay, let's welcome Professor Zhao Yun uh, to deliver his presentation today. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Liu. It is a great honor for me to be invited to give the talk today. I know I think this is an eminent series of talk on the environmental law. Uh, so I think really very much appreciate the uh, opportunity. Uh, and of course, I think uh, uh, when I really received the invitation, I have been thinking, I think, what I should talk about. Of course, Professor Liu has very kindly, I think, looked into my profile and uh, advice that some topics like space, uh, space commercialization, uh, space uh, issues, I think that will be relevant to the environmental uh, part. I think I have been thinking, I think actually, of course, I think space law of, uh, in the first place appears to be very unique, very sp strange to many of you probably, uh, but actually space law in nowadays is very closely related to our daily lives. If you simply look at um, the mobile use, if we look at the TV broadcasting, etc., these are really very close to our daily lives. And similarly, uh, environment has always been a very important issue because we have noted in outer space, although this is a place uh, uh, common to all, but we realize there are also very serious environmental issues already. In particular, when we look at a, a, a space debris, the really a very serious issue. If we look back in the 1970s or 1980s, we definitely can see a lot of issues regarding the space debris mitigation issue, how to maintain a sustainable environment for uh, the current generation or and also the next generation so that it will not be close to other countries or future generations. So that's why I have been thinking how to combine these two. So let me share my PowerPoint first so that 
يو واحد Yes, uh, so that's why I choose uh, the topic like the space commercialization and space sustainability, a softening of space law. Um, the central theme that I would like to discuss today is that um, this, uh, from the very beginning, we have been thinking about the space law. And we noted that several very important uh, international space convention has, uh, has been adopted during 1960s to 1970s. Afterwards, in a, starting from 1980s, when we look at the rapid development of space commercialization, we realize that it's rather difficult to adopt uh, uh, international space conventions. Uh, we increasingly find out that soft laws are playing more and more important roles. So that's why um, uh, I'm arguing that the space law now is really uh, softened by the adoption of a series of uh, uh, soft law documents. And whether this is good or not, uh, of course, I think many people say there will be serious problem regarding the efficiency and effectiveness of uh, soft law documents. But um, I, of course, my view is that, of course, the ideal situation would be uh, international conventions binding documents to deal with the space commercialization and space sustainability. But uh, in view or in light of the difficulty in concluding um, international binding documents, soft law doc instruments appears to be the second best approach. So that's why a softening of soft law appears to be the trend that will be move ahead. Uh, so I think that's something I would like to discuss today. Of course, I use the two areas. One is space commercialization. The other is a space sustainability as example to illustrate how the law, the hard law and soft laws moved in in areas of space law. So I think that was starting point. I think I would like to make it uh, clear uh, in very beginning. Now, let me move further. Uh, space law is relatively a new issue. Um, for a long time, space has been considered to be the final frontier uh, for the conquer by human beings. Uh, only in 1957, after the launch of the first man-made satellite by the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, we, was, uh, we say that the, that's the start of the space era. So the 1957, we always say that's a starting point. Uh, then very quickly, we can see the United States and the former Soviet Union are in competition with each other during the Cold War period. Of course, the former Soviet Union has taken the first step, um, 1957 and then 1961 with the first human being in space. The United States will not repeat what has been done by the former so Soviet Union. So that's why we can see after a few years, the United States became the first country to send human being to the moon. So in 1969, with the emergence of the space activities, that's obviously a need to set up a specific rules to regulate space activities. We can see at the international level, the United Nations is a major player in the rule making. So from 1957, the United Nations started to react very quickly by setting up relevant organizations and adoption, adopting several uh, important documents. Um, so here we are use the uh, uh, origins of a space law from 1958, uh, one year after the first man-made satellite was launched. Uh, the UNGA, United Nations General Assembly, adopted the first uh, uh, resolution calling for the international cooperation in space activities. And in the same year, the United Nations set up or created um, ad hoc committee. Um, one year later, this ad hoc committee was uh, um, transferred or transformed to be a permanent body. Uh, entity, which was called United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, UN Corpus. UN Corpus, since them, has served as a very important forum for the negotiation of uh, space law treaties, in particular the five uh, space treaties that was adopted during the 1960s to 1970s. Then two years later, in 1961, 
the United Nations General Assembly adopted another very important resolution regarding the international cooperation. But of course, it moves one step further than the 1958 resolution. It put on several important principles. For example, the peaceful uses of outer space, uh, for example, uh, regarding um, uh, the registration of space objects with the United Nations Secretary General, etc. So 1961 uh, was, uh, was a very important uh, time when we see the necessity for registration of the space objects that were launched into outer space. Then another two years, in 1963, UNGA resolution regarding the legal principles for space activities. 1963 resolution was considered to be rather important. It forms a basis for the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. Those, these principles that were put out in 1963 resolution was put in or copied or basically into the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. So now we can see that from 1957 to 1966, this 10 year period, the UN or UNGA played a rather important role by adopting uh, UNGA resolutions to guide the space activity. This was a time uh, we say the space law or soft law started in the space field without binding documents. Now the first space treaties was made in 1967. So, after the soft law period, we moved to the period when the hard law was made. Uh, from 1967 to 1979, uh, this around 12 years of time, we have the five very important space treaties, uh, which was made by the UN, by the UN. Uh, five space treaties. Now we look at uh, here the Outer Space Treaty, 1967. This is the first uh, space law treaty. Um, which has uh, uh, um, uh, basically uh, been accepted almost by almost uh, important space-faring nations already with 111 member states now. Uh, I also briefly mentioned that Outer Space Treaty is also reproduction of the UNGA resolution in 1963 with those important principles uh, put down in the uh, treaty. Uh, on the one hand, we said it's good. Now from the resolution, from the soft law documents to hard law, binding documents, that's one uh, very good. But on the other hand, we also see the problem with the Outer Space Treaty uh, because these are only principles, very general. That means the Outer Space Treaty needs to be further concretized. So that's why we can see further development later on. One year later, we have the rescue agreement, which deals with the rescue of astronauts. Astronauts was considered to be the uh, envoys of mankind. We do need to render assistance or rescue uh, uh, measures, actions uh, to save to help the astronauts in outer space. So that's a rescue agreement in 1968. Uh, now the, there are 98 states. A uh, rescue agreement was made and a very interesting uh, environment because astronauts at that time, only from the former Soviet Union and the United States, other countries did not have any interest in concluding this kind of convention with the United States or former Soviet Union. Now, the two countries, the two superpowers negotiate with other countries saying, if you agree to negotiate rescue agreement with us, we will be happy to continue negotiation with you the liability convention. Obviously, if the satellite falls down in other countries, the other countries would like to claim for compensation. So as a kind of exchange, so they reached the 1968 rescue agreement and then 1972, the liability convention, now also 98 countries already. Liability deals with, of course, the compensation issue, the absolute liability, uh, fault liability, etc. So all these were put down in the 1972 convention. Afterwards, we have the 1975 registration convention, which requires the member states to sign, uh, to register uh, the space 
object with the UN Secretary General. The function of the registration convention is to ensure that uh, in case any liability comes up, it will be easy to uh, identify the, uh, the ownership of the space objects. So the registration convention uh, is good. Now we have 70 states, 70 states. Um, of course, uh, co as compared with Outer Space Treaty and Rescue Agreement Liability Convention, this is a relatively lower number of member states. But we should note that previous slide, I also mentioned about the 1961 UNGA resolution. This put in the principle of registration. So that means if you are not the members to the 1975 convention, you can still register with UNGA, UN uh, Secretary General in accordance with uh, the, uh, the resolution. So that, but of course, the, the resolution itself is not binding. So the member states have a choice, have, uh, they can decide. Uh, so that's a fourth convention. And lastly, we come to the Moon Agreement. Moon Agreement, you can see the number of member states relatively low, only 18 member states. Uh, major space faring nations are not yet the members to the Moon Agreement, like the United States, Russia, China, uh, etc. All these space powers are not, not yet members to the Moon Agreement. The largest country uh, to the Moon Agreement is Australia. So Australia is a member to the Moon Agreement, and then there are also some other small countries like the Netherlands, etc. Uh, the reason why. Of course, this has something to do with uh, uh, natural resources exploitation uh, because they use a common heritage of mankind. So the, there were quite a lot of concern regarding the, how to interpret the common heritage of mankind. I think this is really something very similar to the law of sea. Uh, but of course, the law of sea convention was, was successful in a way, but the moon agreement uh, at, uh, at the current stage was still not very successful. Of course, there are quite a lot of discussions regarding uh, what will be the regime to realize uh, the space resource uh, exploitation, utilization, etc. So I think this is a background of the hard law period from 1967 to 1979. After 1979, we do not really see a lot of the conventions that were adopted. Uh, so let me look at some important principles that were put on in the UNGA resolution and then the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. I think these are some very important principles that guide uh, the space activities, uh, free exploration and use of outer space. So all the countries have access to outer space. You have the freedom to explore. You have the freedom to use outer space. Of course, there are also some arguments saying, yes, the principle is fine. But the question is, how do we understand the term use? Are we going to only mention about the use of the um, um, outer space, or are we including the space resources or not? So there are some kind of understanding, the areas, the scope, or are we going to use only the, um, uh, well, uh, uh, certain part of the uh, planet or celestial bodies, or are we referring to the resources below the surface of the celestial bodies? So there are quite some discussions regarding uh, how broad the right to use the utilization. That's one. The second, province of mankind. I wouldn't say pro uh, uh, that uh, this is something uh, relevant to the common heritage of mankind. Here's a province of mankind. We only refer to the uh, 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 geographical areas. So outer space and celestial body belongs to the province of mankind. So all the countries are free to use, but there's also very important principle regarding non-appropriation. That means no one country can claim for sovereignty through the use, through occupation, uh, etc. So uh, no sovereignty in outer space. Uh, then it also mentioned about international cooperation, which has been emphasized several times regarding uh, the use of uh, uh, outer space, uh, the celestial body, and also natural resources. This 
principle I will further uh, elaborate when we move to the space sustainability, I think this part. Uh, peaceful uses of outer space is a yet another very important principle. Uh, they believe that uh, peaceful uses of outer space is rather important, not only to um, the current generation, but also to the future generation. Moreover, uh, this is something um, they have agreed upon um, to make uh, to keep the status quo, the outer space. That means uh, we are not going to introduce any kind of weapons or whatever. But of course, uh, later on, there was some development, the peacefulness. How do we understand the term peacefulness? So that's something I think uh, in a th uh, in theory, there are some discussions already. How do we understand the peacefulness? And then, of course, there are also space environmental protection. This principle was also put in the Article 9, Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, but very um, superficial. Uh, there's no very clear terms regarding the environmental protection. But if we really want to find something, that's the only article that we can find out. Yes, we do need to consider the environmental issue in outer space. So that's why we will need to look at the soft law documents regarding environmental protection at a later stage, which of course I will move a little bit further to talk about. Uh, now, that the documents that were made during 1967 to 1979, after 1979, not many uh, binding documents or no binding documents were made in the UN forum, which is a pity. Uh, but we note that 1980s is a time when uh, space commercialization started. So that's why there was some latest development and challenges of uh, space law. One is uh, space commercialization. Um, the very important examples include uh, telecommunications. Uh, when we use the uh, telecommunications uh, for, uh, for telephone, for mobile, uh, for um, internet services, because when we look at the telecommunications, we divide the telecommunications into um, uh, basic telecommunication services and value added telecommunication services. Uh, so basic telecom, we look at the telephone normal services, uh, um, but at value added services, we look at email services, uh, internet services, et cetera. So that's one area which has been rather successful when we look at the WTO uh, liberalization of the telecommunication services. That, that's the first area. The second area we look at is a remote sensing. We are using this remote sensing to collect data. So how do we protect these data? There are also some discussion, what kind of data we are referring to? Uh, it, um, so in accordance with some, with some documents, we divide the do data into different categories and we will give some protections. And how can we mar uh, marketize or commercialize all these data? Uh, so that's the second areas. And the third areas, now we are looking into the exploitation of uh, natural resources. Uh, that of course has something to do with the 2015 American laws regarding the uh, exploitation of space resources. Uh, so that's uh, some of the areas which is going on. But space commer uh, commercialization goes beyond what I have just mentioned. There are quite a lot of legal issues um, arose. Uh, so for example, IP protection, property rights, etc. Uh, so all these are coming up. Uh, space environment and sustainability is yet another very important issue. Um, we know that 1967, we have already had uh, one very uh, general provisions in outer space treaty, but with more uh, increasingly more activities conducted in outer space, we realize there are quite a lot of space debris, which causes risks or dangers to future space activities. What can we do with the space debris? Um, so uh, a lot of discussions were carried out regarding the space debris and mitigation measures. Um, and the discussion goes beyond the space debris. They are looking at more broad scope regarding the, um, uh, the sustainability issue. Uh, but sustainability issue, we also can be broad. So for example, we talk about the traffic management because we are talking about space tourism. If we really, 
uh, have the, all these space travels, uh, what kind of traffic regime should be placed to avoid collision, uh, potential collision, et cetera. Uh, so the traffic management issue and also confidence and um, C CTMB. <laughs> trust and confidence, sorry, TCBM, uh, trust and confidence building mechanism, where well, all these are discussed under this very broad uh, scope, um, TCBM, trust, tra uh, trust and confidence building mechanism. And then the space security, of course, uh, this has something to do with uh, um, peaceful uses so of outer space, space force, etc. cetera. Uh, but of course, today, I think basically I'll focus more on the commercialization and environmental issues. Uh, commercialization. Um, in the first stage, we can only rely on the government, on the states, uh, to start with the space activities. But it's uh, from 1980s, we can see more and more countries are able to uh, launch their satellites. So there's an increasing number of participants, but not only public bodies, not only governmental entities, uh, we can see more and more private um, non-governmental entities are very interested in the space activities. So that's also increasing private capital investment. So in a way, if we look at the European uh, navigation system, the Galileo navigation system, European uh, Union, they are using as a PPP, public-private partnership, to start with the space commercialization. Uh, but um, uh, uh, the United States, Japan are doing very well in the, the space commercialization field. A lot of important private entities are in place for space activities. And then there's also exploitation of uh, space resources. Uh, so uh, that's quite a lot of uh, new issues are coming up. Uh, that's why we can see that the, uh, the laws, the uh, five space treaties that were adopted during 1960s or 1970s, during the Cold War period, um, at that time, they did not really take into consideration about the space commercialization. They use the state or intergovernmental organizations as a main entity, main subject. But now we can see private entities are increasingly involved in space activities. So what can we do? Uh, moreover, uh, we can see there are quite a lot of on-orbit transfer of satellite. So what can we do with all these new type of space activities? Uh, space environment and space security. So uh, uh, there are, uh, of course, uh, uh, the increasing space debris and the harmful interference. Uh, the picture on, uh, on the left side, you can see that uh, uh, the Earth actually have, has been surrounded with many satellites with, uh, surrounded by the space debris already. So, uh, so that's a legal dilemma of active removal of space debris. So uh, what kind of measures should be taken and what, uh, which countries or which group of countries should be um, involved or they should take the responsibility, et cetera. Then there's a space orbit um, uh, congestion. And now uh, like the SpaceX, they launch uh, thousands of satellite to outer space. So the, that will be the conjunction issue, uh, how to resolve. Then uh, there are also threat of uh, space weaponization and also some kind of uh, proposals regarding the prohibition of placement of a weapon in outer space, et cetera. So there are quite a lot of uh, discussions already. Uh, that's uh, the something we can see the, um, problem, new issues are coming up. That's why there's a regulatory gap for the new space activities. Uh, the five space treaties are obviously not enough. So what can we do? If we look at the situation from 1980s to now, I think there are several ways. Uh, one way is a space law making by other entities. That means the UN, since you fail to make any new conventions after 1979, other entities will take up the role. And I believe that is good, especially when it comes to space commercialization. So that's why we, uh, WTO, World Trade Organization, was able to make some documents to deal with the telecommunications services. So the GATS, the general agreement on trading services is one document which also has some relevance to 
uh, the telecommunication services. So that's one WTO. Another organization is UNIDOA. Um, that's the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law in Italy. They also make a, not a, a very important convention. That's the Cape Town Convention. Cape Town Convention to deal with the uh, space financing issue. That's a space protocol was made uh, to deal with the financing of the space assets. Um, but of course, a space protocol faces a lot of challenges because many countries still have doubts. But anyhow, the UNIDOA is doing something regarding uh, the space assets issue. Uh, and then, of course, the involvement of private entities, there are quite a lot of discussions whether uh, any other entity should also get involved. But mainly, this now, till now, that's the WTO and UNIDOA are doing something. Uh, my view is that uh, probably now the United Nations uh, have difficulty and it's probably not the ideal entity to deal with the space commercialization. We need to have uh, other intergovernmental organizations in the space, uh, in the commercial field to look at specific areas of uh, space commercialization. That's one aspect. The second aspect, we look at the rapid development of national space legislation. That means we do not have international conventions. Now we really ask uh, space firing nations, you make your own domestic law to regulate space activities. So we can see that UN corpus uh, make a lot of uh, workshops on space law to uh, help with the capacity building. They give you the idea how to make the national space legislation. The same, the International Law Association issued a model law to tell you if you are making national space legislation, um, uh, you can follow this style. And then uh, the UNGA resolution also issued a, a resolution regarding how to make national space legislation. So the purpose is to ask the state, the space faring nations, to uh, start legislation to fill in the gap. And this can provide a testing bed so that uh, if the, it, it mature, uh, the situation matures, then the international society can make, uh, uh, make international conventions. That's the first two ways. But the most important we can see at the in international level is a soft lawmaking. It becomes more and more important uh, from uh, 1980s. Uh, one, the most typical way is a UNGA resolution, that's one. But there are also other documents that were made by other entities. Here I use one example regarding the European Union. They have um, uh, put forward a proposal to have a code of conduct. If you launch a satellite to outer space, then what kind of conduct you should follow, ethical rules, etc. So these are uh, something I would like to look into, the soft law making. Now, UNGA, uh, as I have very uh, briefly mentioned, is a one most important approach or model of soft law documents in space law. Um, after 1979, we can see these are the few very important UNGA resolutions that were adopted. 1982, it deals with the TV broadcasting, TV broadcasting, 1982. 1986, they adopted the principles to deal with remote sensing. And 1992, deal with the, the use of nuclear power sources. 1996, it adopts the principle of international cooperation. And 2004, they adopt the understanding or the application of the concept of launching state. What kind of country can be considered as launching state? Then 2007, it, uh, it provides recommendations on how to improve or enhance the practice in the registration of space objects. And in 2013, there's a resolution regarding uh, the national space legislation. So these are a few very important UNG resolutions that were adopted after 1979. And there are also uh, some other soft law documents, as I mentioned, regarding the EU code of conduct for the peaceful uses of outer space uh, by the EU. Then UN corpus, they also made quite a lot of uh, 
uh, documents, uh, soft law documents, like in the field of uh, space environmental protection, that's a UN corpus, space debris mitigation guidelines, and the working group on space sustainability. And in the field of international space cooperation, the UN corpus also set up a working group on the review of international mechanism for cooperation. Uh, all these have led to the adoption of soft law documents. So these are um, the pictures to look at the adoption of soft laws by different entities after 1979. Uh, space debris mitigation guidelines was adopted by the UN Corpus, but please note that UN Corpus have two subcommittees. Um, in the first place, they have been thinking that it will be ideal if the legal, sub legal subcommittee can adopt these documents, but in the end, uh, they move the item to the science and, te science and technical uh, subcommittee for the adoption of these documents. That means the list of guidelines are mainly very technical. And of course, it's not the binding documents, of course. So the, the, uh, it put down several uh, measures on how to mitigate the space debris. These guidelines are not binding, but it's rather important because this could be considered as further deliberation of Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty. Furthermore, um, that's a liability convention mentioned about the fault liability. So this can be used kind of a standard or duty of care. If you fail to uh, uh, satisfy these technical standards or uh, soft law standards, then we can argue that could be the um, uh, violation of the duty or negligence or fault. So uh, this uh, um, have been considered to be rather important. That means that member states needs to take some measures to satisfy the obligations or duties under Article 9 of Outer Space Treaty. Uh, when it comes to the space sustainability, um, in the very beginning, it only refers to the traditional areas of the environmental protection or space debris mitigation. Um, but later on, it was further extended to other areas. So uh, they, uh, they also mentioned that it's rather important. All states shall have equal access to space and the ability to benefit from space. And moreover, uh, outer space should not be uh, beneficial only to the current generation, it should be beneficial to the future generations. So that's why uh, they believe that international cooperation is a way to realize space sustainability. Because this will be mutually beneficial. And uh, Although the, the document itself can benefit the two countries, but in the end, it will benefit the international society as a whole to realizing the principle of uh, uh, province of mankind in the end. So the, the document's long-term sustainability working group with the UN corpus, they put the a committee. So here's a term of a reference and method of work of the working group on the long-term sustainability of uh, outer space activities of a scientific and technical subcommittee. So they mentioned about the international cooperation and moreover, it mentioned about the um, uh, conservation should be taken uh, um, into account in particular the benefits of uh, developing countries and to ensure that all countries are able to, are able to have uh, equitable access to outer space and resources and benefits associated with it. Uh, furthermore, uh, it also mentioned about the necessity for the international society to uh, reach consensus. And the documents was adopted uh, in 2018. Basically, it includes four parts. 
the policy and regulatory framework for space activities. It mentioned uh, about the necessity of uh, national space legislation. Uh, a state should uh, authorize and license space activities. Uh, they should have clear requirement in issuance of license, et cetera. Uh, safety of uh, space operations is more technical. What kind of measures should be taken? For example, you should uh, have information sharing mechanism. You should have a notification mechanism in case there's any danger, in case of any potential collision. You should notify uh, and you should have advanced notification, et cetera. So these are more technical. C, it mentions about international cooperation, capacity building, and awareness issue. And finally, uh, it talks about the scientific and technical research and development. So these are the guidelines regarding the space sustainability. Now, in this document, it emphasizes about international cooperation. Let me spend the last few minutes to talk about this principle, uh, because this principle has been in place from 1957 and then further developed in 1996. And this has been reiterated in various soft law documents, including the long-term sustainability issue. Uh, international cooperation has been considered to be fundamental principle, and it has been considered as part of the customary international law already. And uh, 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 it is a means to realize peaceful uses of outer space from the start of the space age, international society emphasized and put in the resolution, uh, the importance and put in the resolution and finally into the outer space treaty. And this has been first elaborated by the 1996 UNGA resolution. Uh, this document, the UNGA resolution has further deliberation about how to understand, how to apply the principle of international cooperation. So it put on the formal requirement and the substantive requirement. The formal requirement here, it mentions that states are to decide on the effectiveness and appropriateness of a specific mode of cooperation. So you can decide whether you are going to have a governmental or non-governmental, commercial or non-commercial uh, cooperation, or uh, cooperation can be carried out at a global, multilateral, regional, or bilateral, etc. And not only between the space faring nations, uh, it also can be carried out between countries at um, at all levels of uh, development. So uh, between uh, developing countries, non-space faring nations, etc. That's a formal aspect. Uh, when it comes to the substantive aspect, uh, it um, first of all put down the very important principle of party autonomy that the state, you yourself, can decide, but with minimum standards to protect the rights and legitimate interests of the states. So it put down uh, something like a mutually acceptable basis and on an equitable basis to be fair, to be reasonable. And um, the benefits will not only go to the two countries, but also to the international society as a whole. Very importantly, it also looking to the special needs of developing countries. So developed countries should be encouraged to offer acceptance to developing countries in advancing their space capabilities and certain preferential treatment means real fairness. We are not looking at the um, equality in money investment. We are looking at the real fairness and reasonableness to the developing countries. And in the end, the, uh, this kind of cooperation should be mutually beneficial and lead to common development. So the long-term sustainability has gone beyond the purely the environmental protection uh, space debris mitigation, it goes a little bit beyond uh, to um, uh, broad, broad issues, uh, intergenerational issues. So this so uh, these soft law documents indeed play a very important role nowadays to provide the guidance to the space activities. So now, from this discussions, I think probably uh, the conclusion here is that the space era started with a satellite usage. In 1957, then very quickly, the, the international society, or in particular, the United Nations, were able to make, uh, take the steps 
to come up with soft law documents, hard law documents, and then back to soft law documents in light of the difficulty in concluding conventions in the era of space commercialization and privatization. And it's very important to know that the dual use nature of space activities really means that the commercialization and privatization is an inevitable change in a space field. And the development of space law is more diversified with the ongoing space commercialization process. And softening of the space law is an ongoing change in view of the diversifying national interests in a space activities. So I think that's something um, I think I would like to put forward the views. So with this, I uh, conclude my presentation and pass the floor back to uh, the chair. And of course, I will be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zhao, for your uh, very thought-provoking uh, presentation. And it's super interesting, uh, especially uh, as someone like me, I, 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 I'm sure that Karen Scott uh, would agree with me uh, because Karen is also, I see Karen still is also in the audience. Like, like I mean, the space law and the law of the sea are really like twins and brothers because I, I keep hearing like common heritage of mankind, what's the meaning of the use and how to achieve sustainability, the dual use, and all these kind of issues are now being hotly debated uh, in the development of the, of, of the ocean governance, like the in the high seas, uh, actually just concluded uh, last week uh, in the UN. So <laughs> that's super interesting. But anyway, uh, I will just leave the floor to uh, our audience. I'm sure there will be questions. Uh, we have about uh, 12 minutes. So anyone who wants to uh, uh, ask Professor Zhao questions, please uh, take the floor. I can't, uh, yes, uh, Therese, yes, yeah, please, uh, just introduce who you are and, and uh, yeah. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Chris Van Eyck, uh, and I'm staying up at ridiculous o'clock because I'm a big fan of, of your work, uh, Professor Zhao, um, and because I'm a big fan of environmental law seminars that include space. Um, I had a quick kind of thought-provoking kind of question, and I, I was hoping maybe to get your view and, and maybe if anyone else has a thought, which is, um, I wanted to ask about a specific moment, which is in 1962, spring 1962 to sort of autumn 1963, when they're drafting the declaration that, as you pointed out, would become the OST and give us this whole like sort of uh, volley of binding rules. There's a moment in which the USSR side argues that space should be called an environment in the draft declaration. And the US says no, because West Ford had just gone down and they were not so keen on the pollution environmental language. That's something that we now know. It wasn't as clear then. But I, I, I've been thinking a lot about sort of the almost what ifs and maybes of what law would have been. And I, I was just wondering what sort of if you had any thoughts on this, because I, I feel like too often we pretend that environmental law came from the sky in Stockholm a decade later. Um, but it seems like we kind of almost missed something there. Uh, should I respond or? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, I think, for the very interesting questions and the very important, I think, regarding the environmental protection issue. And indeed, if we look at the previous documents in the 1962 um, and also the 1967, uh, we do not really have clear wordings regarding the environmental protection. Um, the way at the time, of course, I think have, um, the outer space and the celestial bodies were considered as the common, uh, uh, no, uh, the province of mankind. And we are not going to do any harm to all the, uh, these areas. And at that time, they did not really think, uh, consider a lot of the space activities will be carried out. Uh, of course, I think a lot of the issues uh, they were not expected, including the space commercialization, etc. So uh, they look at all these very general provisions uh, regarding the use, how to regulate the ongoing space, the space activities. And the 1960s documents were basically monopolized by the two superpowers. What will be the most 
benefit of most important vital to them. They like they think about the rescue will be rather important. They realize the return of space object will be more important. And the liability probably, of course, will be important, but of course, as kind of a deal, uh, a deal uh, to exchange the conclusion of the conventions. So I think that kind of a background, I think, were already there. But slowly, uh, is in particular to 1980s and 1990s, with more and more space activities coming up, the space faring nations realize is uh, the highly risky now. If we launch a satellite with uh, too many space debris in outer space, what can we do? If, if we have the space traffic, space travels, we do need to have some rules in place. And space debris poses some dangers or barriers to further development of space commercialization, et cetera. Uh, and of course, I think this I think will more closely uh, uh, related to uh, the national interests, I assume. I think the space field, I think more closely related to national interests and national security. So that's why uh, those more needing urgent actions will be put forward first. And slowly as they realize the issues are coming up. Uh, but now, if we say the conventions, what kind of uh, documents might be in place? I must say it may or may take longer period of time because in the very first place, we have been thinking that at least we can have a sort of law documents made by the legal subcommittee of the UN corpus. That's the idea. But in the end, they realize it's rather difficult and they move this kind of a legal, uh, from the legal subcommittee to the uh, uh, science and techn uh, technical subcommittee for uh, deliberation. So that's why we can see that that's indeed a need now, but um, uh, it's rather difficult. I think there's various difficulties to come, uh, come up with a document, binding documents. So that's the second best approach that we can see as a current stage, but we cannot preclude the possibility of uh, um, adopting any kind of documents in the future. But without these kind of binding documents, we also say that the environmental, existing environmental uh, documents, we can also apply because the article two of the Outer Space Treaty also made it very clear that the uh, international law also applies to the space activities. So I hope this is, my very general response to the questions and really response, I think, to the, to the point that you raised. Yeah, thank you. And I think Karen, uh, you got a question? I have. Thanks ever so much. Thank you very much, um, Professor, for your uh, presentation. That was fascinating. As Nengi says, um, I'm coming to this very much from a sort of an environmental law of the sea perspective, and it is really interesting to note the parallels. And I think that's probably where um, my question's coming from. Um, I wonder whether you could comment on um, the extent to which concepts such as due regard and due diligence have been developed in the context of space law, because these are obviously principles which we're quite familiar with in other areas and of which are actually being quite actively developed by the courts and it seems to me that those are principles which would have um, you know really good application in terms of competing uses and I just wonder to what extent they've been picked up and developed in forums in relation to space law. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much Professor Scott. I think still have uh, fond memories of my stay in New Zealand uh, a few years back, I think that's an annual, conf uh, annual conference of the international law of the New Zealand and Australia. <laughs> so thank you for your question. Uh, yes, I think you really, I think, pick up one very important issue, the understanding of due regard, due diligence. And this issue actually, I think, uh, is rather important in every year's discussion, especially in moot court, space law moot court competition. We always argue that due regard, due diligence, what should we do? Now, this, of course, has something to do again with Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, Outer Space Treaty have uh, mentioned that when the countries are carrying out space activities, you should also have due regard to the interests of other uh, states. So that means this, of course, take into account the legal nature of the outer space and celestial bodies. Um, is a, com a common province of mankind. Yes, you have the right to free uh, access to outer space, you have the free use, etc. but you cannot only look at your own interests, but you also need to consider the interests of other countries, in particular, the interests of uh, developing countries. So these are something uh, which have been uh, particularly mentioned 
it's kind of a balance. I think on the one hand, you can of course uh, carry out activities in a way which it complies with uh, international law. But on the other hand, you have to take into account uh, the interests of other countries. So I think that um, if we um, um, look at the document or the Article Nine itself, we only look at the uh, interests of other countries' due regard and due diligence. Uh, again, I think if we move a little bit further from outside the Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, I think this probably has something to do with the uh, application of the liability convention, in particular the fault-based liability, fault-based liability. Uh, so uh, for what will be considered as fault? What will be the negligence? How do we define? How do we, do we determine? Now we do not have substantive rules to define uh, what kind of standard you have to satisfy. Uh, and there's no binding documents telling you like traffic management, there's no binding documents, not like the civil aviation in the um, uh, maritime, uh, that's kind of a code of conduct, etc. No, not in place. So that's why we are looking to possibly, we need to have some kind of guidelines at least uh, to determine whether you have exercised due diligence, due regard. So this is something still missing, I must say, but of course, I think this part we will look at into uh, some sort of law documents. To, uh, that's uh, one function of the sort of law document to see whether it's possible to develop into customary international law through state practice, et cetera. Uh, I think that's one area uh, which will move further because now uh, the ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, has started to set up a, a, a working group to look into what kind of rules should be set up. So this will be further concretized but for the time being, we know that in principle, due regard, due diligence principle still there, but how to exercise that will be something for further interpretation for further improvement. Okay, thank you. All right, so we got two minutes left. I think we have we can have the last question uh, and a brief answer. Uh, Jose, Jose? Uh, Hello, Professor. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding the common heritage of uh, humankind and the exploitation of natural resources. Do you think that uh, this principle is well developed to accommodate uh, exploitation of natural resources in space nowadays? Yes, th th thank you for, for this very important question. Um, I, uh, the common heritage of mankind has been, uh, been a barrier for the member states to join the Moon Agreement for a long time, from 1979 to now. Um, so um, that's really a lot of discussions regarding uh, whether we need to come up with a mechanism, because the Moon Agreement has also an article which says when the condition matures or the, when the commercialization becomes reality, then the international society should come up with a mechanism mechanism uh, on how to exploit natural resources to realize common her heritage of mankind. But till now, we do not have the mechanism. So the 2015, the United States came up with its own domestic law, uh, arguing that we fully respect the international obligations, but we need to move ahead, to look at the exploitation of natural resources. Individuals and private entities can um, fly to outer space to take back the natural resources. And this will be considered their own property. They can sell for profits, but uh, they, it did not mention about the state because they act only as individuals, private entities. So after the adoption um, of the document, as a domestic law in uh, October, 2015, then very soon, Two months later, December 2015, the uh, Interna International Institute of Space Law issued a position document saying, of course, we can see that the American domestic law did not violate any existing international law, but we should consider whether this is the ideal way to move ahead or not. But uh, so that although there's no violation, uh, but uh, that obviously, international society have different views. They believe that this kind of approach is not ideal, not the best. Uh, but international society has difficulty in coming up with the documents or mechanism. So that's why we can see Luxembourg is a second country to come up with a similar domestic law. And then the UAE becomes a third country and Japan becomes the fourth country. So now four countries have similar rules, not domestic laws, 
dealing with the issue. And internationally, uh, the, they set up the Hague Working Group to study what kind of mecha mechanism to come up. But this kind of uh, um, discussions are informal, informal. So starting from two years ago, the UN corpus has set up a working group to study or to look into the issue. What kind of mechanism should, to, should be set up? Uh, some scholar argue that common heritage, uh, common heritage of mankind is so controversial, we should remove the term from the Moon Agreement. But majority of scholars say, common heritage of mankind is such a beautiful term. Why we need to remove? We, what we need to do is more pragmatic to come up with a me mechanism. So that will be the way to move forward. Uh, for me, I think I always think that probably we will look into the multilateral mechanism uh, to come up with, with a, uh, a mechanism to deal with the uh, space exploration uh, or exploitation of natural resources. I think that will be rather uh, important. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, once again for your uh, wonderful presentations and also the uh, discussions that I really enjoy. And I hope everyone else also enjoyed this kind of very, uh, very uh, thought provoking uh, discussions. And uh, with this, I just conclude our first webinar of the year for the Center for Beyond the Law here at Macquarie. And we thank you everyone for participating, especially, of course, we thank once again Professor Zhao's presentation. And uh, I will see you next month. Next month, we will welcome uh, uh, a colleague from uh, University of Cambridge, Lost Lotpack Center for International Law, to to discuss uh, the deep sea bed mining, which is something to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.